name is Malva Petersman, and I'm 28 years old. I'm a master's student of communications and culture. I also spend a lot of my time outdoors. I traveled a lot as a child, so I grew to love traveling from a very young age. My greatest desire was to go to Africa. I wanted to visit the African country of Senegal. When I decided to go to Senegal, it was really like a bit of a dream come true. Senegal is a country which was first colonialized by the French many years ago. So the main language spoken in Senegal is French. Senegal is located on the west coast of Africa, bordering the Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic Ocean also borders my hometown, and I was very interested to learn about how people who share an ocean with me live a life which is probably completely different from my own. My play landed in Dakar, which is the capital city of Senegal, and my first destination. Dakar is a very large city, the largest in Senegal. It has two million inhabitants and is described as a bustling seaport. The traffic in Dakar is incredible and I was so glad not to be behind the wheel. There's buses and pedestrians and motorcycles and bicycles everywhere. I left the bustling capital city, Dakar, and took a ferry to the island of Goree, which lies just outside the port of Dakar. Goree is an island with a sad claim to fame as a former slave station. The Senegalese were captured and kept on the island until they were sold as slaves. It was here that I met my guide, Mara. Hey, Hi. what's up? You How are you doing? Mara. Yes. I'm Melva. Melva? Oh, yeah. Nice According to, to the description, that's you, really. <laughs> yeah. How are you doing? Good, thank you. Since when are you here? I've only, I just got here. So. Oh, great. So you're enjoying your first son on Gora Island, too. My beautiful first son in Senegal. It's very nice. Mara, tell me what we're going to be seeing on Gore today. On Gore Island, you may be seeing uh, architecture, but the most important side is the history. And as you know, slavery happened here. And if Whenever you're talking about slavery, I think, you know, we can't forget to mention it, you know, Gore Islands. Because, yeah. you know, uh, three centuries, maybe and a half, you know, happens a slave trade, which is a, ba uh, a sad story in the past. So we're going to be seeing the slave house. And so Gore Island was a real center for slavery many years ago. Exactly. Wow. So this is the inside of the slave house. This present slave house, it dates back to 1776, built by the Dutch. The Dutch. And it is the last built slave station on this island, because for the first ones, go back to 1536, built by the Portuguese, who were the first European who have fallen off the soil at this island in 1444. Men, women, and children kept in separate cells. They would be sitting with their backs against the wall, shackled around their necks and arms. In each cell, usually it used to be between 15 to 20 inside the rooms. And as you can see, it's a very small room. And generally, one could find one whole family, father, mother, and child separated. It's like the father will be going to Louisiana, the mother to Cuba or Brazil, and the child to Haiti or the West Indies. So they would split the family Exactly. Exactly. Now what can you tell me about this door here? Along this long stretching corridor leading to the sea, we walk into the door of the voyage No Return. So this door here is the actual door of No Return? Yes, the door of No Return, which means once the slave put their fits here, it means bye-bye Africa. And from this side, usually those guards will be leading over here Two for guards real security. On each side yes. to make sure and the no slave will be lining up two by way. two you know, chain around their necks to be shipped. And then would there be more guards here as well? Two guards, two also guards. another two guards there waiting. So which means that, you know, there was no way for them to escape. There was no way.
So what rooms are these here? Oh, this used to be was um, privileged for the men. And as you can see, it used to be a very small rooms where it used to be loaded over to 15, 20 slaves. And the cells you see in front of this used to be the weighing room. The, uh, sorry, the weighing room? The weighing room. Where they would weigh the slaves to exactly. see if they were strong enough to, to travel? To go. To see if they were strong enough strong to travel, enough. but also for the negotiation for the price. Because it's from this weighing room they can evaluate the strength of each of every slave. And so the, the, the heavier they were, the stronger they were, the more they could ask for them. Exactly. So up here on the top floor is where the masters live. Yes, it used to be the house of the masters and we still rem remind that, you know, how come the masters living in these comfortable places and knowing what's going on downstairs. And they had a balcony? They have a balcony. And they could stand here and watch the slaves leave through that door? Yes. I really want to thank you for taking me here. It's been a very emotional and very strong experience for me here. I heard the most incredible sound coming through the trees. We walked for a while and then came across an older man playing an incredible instrument. This was Yusufa. The song was about how the Senegalese always welcome visitors, and I was one of these visitors that they were welcoming in the song. That amazing instrument that Yusufa was playing is called Aviti. And he plays it almost as if he would play a violin. His fingers were so swift on the bow. I tried to play it, but I wasn't quite as good as Yusufa. Yeah. Yusufa's music would follow me throughout my trip in Senegal. On the next day of my trip in Senegal, Mara and I met Alassane, our driver for the rest of the journey. And then we headed to Pink Lake, the center of a very important Senegalese industry. For this lake is filled with salt. So this here is the salt that comes from the lake? Yes. And these people harvest the salt? Yes, they just go, it's not really far and deep. They have their own equipment. I see their canoe, they have a stick and a basket. Okay, and a basket like this one yes. right here. Mm -hmm. And the salt is not really deep. They just, you know, start by scratching, have the basket deep in the water and, and collect it and take it back. It's kind of like a sieve. Exactly. And then someone comes every day to buy the salt? Yes, there is a lot of companies because, like I said, we export a lot of salt, uh -huh. especially in the Scandinavian country who use it for the snow. And these people live around this area, like the last village we passed by is the Nyak village. And it's a mix, men and women, both, you know, can be working. working. Why are they different colors? Uh, it's because it's uh, taken from a different part in the lake. And the little signs that are poking up out of each pile? Exactly, you know, it you know, means that, you know, these signs belong to these. They have names, they have numbers. Oh, it's like uh, claiming your pile exactly. that you've been working on all day. Exactly. Mara arranged for me to have a little boat ride on one of those boats that collects the salt. Hi. Ladies first. I'm Malva. Bonjour. <laughs> Thank you. Merci. And the lake, how deep is it? Right, right where we are right now, how deep is it? Let's say uh, two, one meter and a half. So two. I could stand here. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the salt is all at the bottom? The real salt is deeply, that's why they have their sticks and basket to go up. Okay, so they dig it out and exactly. bring it up. Inshallah. 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 If there was a translation for the word Inshallah, what would it be? Uh, if God will. 
in one of you have those inshallah you have a lot of like assalamu alaikum the way to greet yes malikum salam it's arab and also for english you have certain words like you know hustle like don't hustle me yeah and walk at the same woman has so you share it so you, you borrow words from other languages exactly and that's the most important part in senegal like i said you know all of our west african countries wherever you go you can see people being in a civil war because there is only two tribes three tribes and they can they are not able to live at the real brotherhood mm -hmm. and each of them wanted to be more powerful than the others but here in Senegal, you see, it's a multiple ethnic groups, yeah. and people just live like real brotherhood. Very interesting. Oh yeah. But it all sort of works together that way. Well, I think I've seen the Salt Lake from an angle that not very many people do. Okay. Merci beaucoup. Very Thank yeah. you. <laughs> I was incredibly lucky to visit a fishing village just as the fishermen were returning from their day at sea. So here we are at the Atlantic Ocean. Yes, in a real fishing village in San Luis. Well, I feel like I'm right at home. Oh, yeah. Except these boats are completely different than oh, what I'm good. used to. Oh, Merva, let's meet this gentleman. He's a fisherman and he's one of the Bonjour. most popular. Bonjour. <laughs> His okay. name is Wali Gallo. Wali Gallo. Uh -huh. And is he the captain of this boat? Uh, he's the captain of the boat. He's the captain. And how many people go out on this boat fishing? Uh -huh. Salmon. 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 How long do they go out for? I need to tell you when they make the yak, but I get the yak. My brother, you can't get it. I'm sure you could. Uh -huh. If they're going 11 in the night, they're coming back at 10 o'clock in the morning. 11 at night to 10 o'clock in the morning. 10 o'clock in the morning. And when they come back, is this whole boat full of fish? No, no, it's the one you're going to get. I'm going to get it. I'm going you know, sometimes they have a lot of fish, sometimes also they come back, you know, without less fish. And the painting on the side of the boat, mm -hmm. I notice all the boats are painted. Just for decoration, but for decoration. also signs, you know, for their own. Sort of to keep them safe when they go? Exactly, sometimes, because you can see some Quranic, you know, written. And do they enjoy their work on the sea? They, they do like it because, you know, their forefathers, that's what they was doing. Yeah. And, you know, it's a, from generation to generation. But it's also the, another way for them to, you know, for the survival, you know, having money on it from this. Thank you very much. Merci. Okay. All right. While the men spend their days on the sea, the women remain on shore, smoking the leftover fish. They first boil it in large cauldrons. Looks like there's something delicious being made here. Yes, oh. that's the smoking fish part. And it's uh, handled usually by this woman you see over here. Bonjour. 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 But so first they boil the fish? And then what happens? First they boil the water, put salt, clean the fish and just put it in and let it be cooked. And let and cook it. So now she takes the fish out? Out. And, and then she'll lay that out to dry in the sun? Exactly. There's a lot of women who export this to the Europe, to the US, you know, also for the Senegalese living there so because they like it. So smoked fish is a, is a big export for Exactly. Senegal. It's an export too. Merci beaucoup. Not far from the fishing village was an area from which people could be ferried to the city. The loading procedure was quite different from what I was used to, so we stopped to watch. Wow. 
After eating all the delicious food in Senegal, I was curious to see how it was prepared. I was so thrilled when our driver, Alassane, invited me to his house to prepare a traditional Senegalese meal with his family. Alison, uh, m'a dit qu'on peut cuisiner un peu. We're going to cook a little bit today, maybe. Uh, yeah. Et qu'est-ce qu'on peut cuisiner? Um, uh, du riz, du rice. Du riz, yeah. au, au poisson. Au poisson, Et rice si. and fish. <laughs> and ça, c'est un plat sénégalais traditionnel. It's a traditional Senegalese meal. I was given an apron, and we went into the kitchen, which was an exterior kitchen. Est-ce que les hommes euh, font la cuisine de temps en temps? Do the men ever cook? No? No? <laughs> there was a gas can, and bubbling inside a pot on top of that gas can was tiboudien, or at least the beginnings of it. Tiboudien is a very traditional Senegalese meal. It consists of rice, fish, and vegetables. Now off we go, it's lunch time. We prepared two platters of delicious food. One platter was shared by the women and children on the porch of the house. The other was shared by myself, Alassane, Mara, Ida, and Mindy Fatu underneath the tree in the yard. And I really felt as though I was almost part of their family. For the last part of my trip in Senegal, I headed out to explore the rural areas in the southern part of the country. On the way, we stopped in a small village where we came across a cultural center. In one corner was a band playing incredible music. corner, there was an incredible art going on. Young men were painting with glue and then covering this glue with sands from all across Senegal. We use here only with sand, only 24 different natural colors. So these are all Yeah, natural coming from different parts here in Senegal. Different for parts it, of Senegal. Yeah, for example, this sand comes from the desert. The, the desert. The Tenere Desert sand. The brown one comes from the desert. The white sand comes from the beach, the small coast, like 75 kilometers from here. This is a Cosmos area, the so. beach of Cosmos, Capsicere. This is a suburb country. So desert, beach, and Cosmos. This is a Sahara desert. This is a second desert. The Sahara desert sand. This black sand comes from volcano, close to airport of Dakar. Now, you can see here the artist makes the design first. The glue on it, and after you're going to put different colors of sand, you're going to see. So he, okay. pa so he paints the whole area with glue, yeah. and then puts sand And then sand after, on. he's going to put different colors of sand. So do these people, did they go to school yeah. before to learn how to do this? Yeah, to learn only for drawing. Oh, for drawing. Only and then drawing. this... But for the sand painting, this is a school. This We're is, gonna come this here is the to school the for sand. that. Yeah. Okay, okay, now the shaking. The sh shaking. And you see the result here. Yay, I think it's <laughs> wonderful. We continued our journey deeper into Senegal, making our way over rough roads to the village of Matana. So Mara, what are we doing this evening? Oh, this evening we're having this special visit to, into this special village, call it the Mahana village. The Mahana village. Yes. Who are we going to meet here? We are going to meet the chef of the village and some members of this, some noble in the village. So some nobles and some elders here. Exactly. 
Oh, the chef of the village, Mr. Boy. Bonjour. Bonjour. For the chief, I would like to ask him uh, how long he's been a chief. Muni mulai lah dipinjat at gane ke chef de village. Four years now, but there was the former one. He died, and he replaced him. He replaced him. Yes. And um, why was he picked to be the chief? Was the former one his father, or how does it work? Yes. 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 Okay. Like, you know, they have to agree all that, you know, they trust Who him they the to confidence. represent them, you know, to the authority. It's like mm -hmm. a parliament. It's like they were in a national assembly and he's the one who represents the parliament. So when they have big decisions, usually he call them in a meeting. They talk it and the last decision will come up to him. Okay, so it's kind of, they, they sort of make decisions together, but he has the final, exactly, the final decisions. The final decision. Mm -hmm. You choose Mahana to be your destination, so they are the most pleased and they say welcome to any time you want to come back here. Well, tell him maybe I will come back. Thank you very much. <laughs> we set out on a tour, and when I turned around, I realized that just about everyone in the village had joined us. We walked to the lake near the village which supplies water not only to Makana, but also to the neighboring villages. The problem with this lake is that it's filled with algae, which not only kills all the fish in the lake, but also causes sickness in the children. This water here, c'est le problème avec le algae, le, the yes, algae um, problem, mm -hmm. is for this water here. Yes, that's the water. That's the water. And that's the algae seen here. Okay, can and you ask him, is this the only water source for the whole village? Usually it's the one they use, you know, for washing, for drinking, for, you know, all their needs. Yeah. But now, with the dangers, they're using the well. They're using the well. And as you can see, most of the villages, they come from different villages. They depend yeah. on this water, which means that it's oh, not going right. to cut only this part, but that he's going to bring it to the village, you know, we pass by coming here. Oh, right. Seems like they don't want you to leave. No, they probably don't. I don't think I want to leave. <laughs> I walked along a beach in Senegal. The longest, emptiest, widest, most incredible beach I have ever been on in my entire life. The beauty of Senegal is one which I've never experienced before in my life, and one which I had not expected to be so emotionally affected by. The varied landscapes have embraced me with their beauty. The people of Senegal have welcomed me time after time into their home. Every new taste, every smell, everything I've touched, and every sound I've heard has made a profound impact on me and the way that I now see the world. I've been transformed by Senegal, and I feel like the luckiest woman in the world.